In a previous career, my next guest was my boss's boss. His name is Peter Remington, a Houston area entrepreneur who now spends his time coaching people to live their best lives and reach their fullest potential. During this episode, you'll learn how running with the bulls in Spain taught him about life, why you shouldn't give up after the first try, and the importance of eradicating the word should from your vocabulary. If you like this episode, please do me a solid and share with somebody in your life or multiple somebodies who you think will also enjoy it. This is how we grow the show. You could also link up and support me at cruise through htx.com. Hi, I'm Ed Sheeran. This is Bruno Mars. Hey, it's Katy Perry. This is your man Flo Rida with Freddie Cruz. This is AJ Mitchell with Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Tell you she go pick Mr. 305 and you already know what it is. My name is Freddie and it's time to cruise through HTX. Two things I remember from our time together at KRBE, though short-lived, but two things I remember about you. One, your email signature and it took a while. I'm a little slow, but it took a while for me to get it. Your email signature said, you're the best, so be the best. And then two, I learned that you run with the bulls in Spain. And of all the ways that one can die on this planet, why would you take a chance by at getting killed by one of these big monsters? And so we can just go wherever the conversation leads. Well, so I, my signature on my emails, be the best, you're the best, you are the best, so be the best, is something I've always been I've always been about motivation. I've always been about lifting people up and so forth. I just want people to realize that they are the best. So my sign off was, you are the best. So be the best. So live up to your, to your highest expectations, to your highest level of you, to the, the person that you are meant to be type thing. And hopefully that would motivate people through their day when they would see my, my text to them. Yeah. It, it took, like I said, it took a while. For me to uh to for it to click and i'm like huh he thinks i'm the best so yeah i better bring it every day <laughs> there we go that's what it's all about i want everybody the highest form of you i want you to bring out every single day yeah and the running with the bulls man you so you still do that i still do that although i have to admit that last year while i was running i've been in the streets 196 times to run the bulls and the reason people go what 196 times well, they run for eight days in Pamplona. Oh, okay. The, uh, all right. So the first run starts on July 7th. The fiesta starts on July 6th. It's when the party explodes and it's just crazy, crazy, crazy. And then that first run is on the 7th and that's at eight o'clock in the morning. And that whole run takes about five minutes and you're done. I mean, truly most runs are over in two minutes and 15 seconds, but huh. the getting there, staging yourself, doing all the other stuff, I'm down my staging point around 7 30 where i meet all my friends and we talk and we talk about which bulls are running because they run a different breed of bulls each day and then each breed has its own kind of characteristics where they hook their horns or come straight at you or however but we talk about that and we actually have this one guy uh, jose who is deaf and mute and is from medicine he, he could hear and speak as a child but they gave him some sort of wrong medicine it, caused him to lose his hearing and his ability to speak, but he's one of the greatest bull runners out there. I mean, he's right there on top of the horns and he will tell you how they're coming. I'm sorry. What, 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 what you said he's on top of the horns. Yeah. So as the bulls come down the street, right, they got their horns. And it's a and small street. He, if I remember correctly, seeing it on video. Yeah. It's a very small street. Oh, it's an alley. It's a, it's a United States alley, basically. It's not a, maybe, maybe a little bit wider than that. And the, you know, being in front of the bulls running on the horns or the horns right behind you, that's, that's a pretty cool thing to do. Pretty Probably cool pretty thing stupid. to do. <laughs> it sounds yeah. also dangerous and crazy. <laughs> yeah, all those things, all those things. But um, anyway, so like I said, we've run for eight days and uh, that's why I've been in the streets 196 times. I've been doing it for 32 years. Oh, so, geez. Yeah, it's how it lasted three. That's longer than my three marriages all combined. <laughs> 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 yeah well okay so uh no obviously no injuries or at least none that i've ever seen on you your face is not scarred that i can tell your no. arms uh when i shake hands with you when i see you out in public uh you've got all you've got your hands all 10 digits you walk yeah, so you got yeah. both legs no missing toes no 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 nothing no like, no, no, none of those things so no. i uh, tore my meniscus running with the bulls once back that was back in 2003 
Did you and, think you uh, were going to die at the moment? When I tore my meniscus, I didn't even realize I did it. I mean, I had so much adrenaline going through my body. No, I was just wondering, know. okay, so it didn't take you out and knock you on the ground. You didn't think you were going to oh, get no. trampled by a human and or a bunch of animals. No, no, not at all. Wow. Um, but what I, it wasn't until later on that afternoon or closer to that evening that also my knee started to swell up. And it got to the size. The next morning I woke up and it was the size of a softball. Oh, geez. And uh, then I realized something was wrong. So I didn't run that day. I kind of missed that day. So How was but, the um, plane ride home after that? Miserable. Thank yeah. you for asking. And uh, <laughs> it was miserable. But uh, it was so funny. So I was living in Atlanta at the time. And I went to go see the knee surgeon for the Atlanta Braves. I'm sitting there on the examination table. He finally walks in. He says, so what happened? Did you step off the sidewalk wrong or what happened? I said, no, nah, I was actually running the bulls in Pamplona. He said, wait a minute, call this whole staff in. He goes, we got to hear this story. But uh, I've had, I've, I've, I mean, I've, I've touched the bulls. I have had a horn this far away from my side of my stomach. And it just go right by me like that. And oh, man. You know, we've had some fun situations. I think of that yeah. scene from the matrix where Neo is dodging the bullets in slow motion. And it's kind of like right, right now I'm envisioning Peter dodging the horn that could easily pierce through his skin and take him out in the, in the blink of an eye. Yeah. It's funny. I, uh, w when you run the bulls, there's three stages of running the bulls, right? First of all, when you're where you are, we want to start your run. The rocket goes off, which is called a chupinazzo. And when that goes off, that means they've opened up the corral to where the bulls are down the road. The bulls start coming out. When the last animal leaves the corral, they shoot off another chupinazzo. This rocket explodes. As soon as the first rocket goes off, people start running. And they're now the course is a half mile long. So you're staged out throughout the whole half, half mile. You don't run the half mile because you cannot outrun a bull. If you have a 75-yard run, you're doing great. And so the first group of runners go by, we call them the Los Valientes. And it's tongue-in-cheek because they'll never see a bull. They'll be in the bull ring and they'll never and they'll run down the street as fast as they can. <laughs> the next group of runners, you know, they'll run. The bulls will eventually catch up to them, but they'll go off to the side of the streets and kind of get off on the wall there and hang out and hide. And the third group of runners, they're coming down. Their eyes are like saucers. They're wide open. You can see the expression on their face as they're huffing and puffing puffing and their arms are going up and down in full swing because they are just charging like crazy. These animals are running a half mile in two minutes, right? That's a four minute mile. That's pretty darn fast. All along, they're going up a hill, making turns, all that, taking some time out to maybe hit somebody or do whatever. They're pretty darn fast. Yeah. And so you get out there. That's the group, the third group that I'm talking about. They're running with the bulls. That's when I take off. When I see them coming down the streets, I take off because I know the bulls will eventually catch up to me and then I can run with them. The, that's how the, the group goes. But the three stages I'm talking about, you have people that are on the sidewalk up against the, the buildings and so forth of mm -hmm. the street. Mm -hmm. And they'll just stand there and they'll be frozen and caught up in fear and just really never move. And I kind of liken that to a lesson in life. Some people live life in fear and they just kind of hang on to the walls, really not really doing much to improve themselves or make themselves better, but they're gonna stand right there at the walls. The next group of people are off the sidewalk, on the street, but they're running along with life. If, I, if you use bulls as a metaphor for life, then the bulls, life is running down the street. Some people, like I said, are up against the wall watching life go past them. Some people are getting closer to life and trying to keep up with life. And then there's this little area that I call the terror barrier. And the terror barrier is this three foot barrier between yourself and life or the bull. And that three foot terror barrier, that's where you have to just lean into it. Like you have to lean into life. You lean into the bulls and you take, take that one huge step closer to the bull. And then the next thing, it's like the matrix. Everything is in slow motion and you're just running with the animal and you're pumping your arms and everything is just smooth and smooth until they pass you because you can't outrun them. Then they pass you, then boom, you're right back in the, in the thrill of everything and you kind of wake up. But that moment there is absolutely fantastic. You talking about this and then you del diving into the metaphor of it all has me wondering if whether or not this is why you do it so many times for 30 plus years, all these dozens and dozens, over 150 days. When I first did it, I didn't know what I was getting into and it scared the daylight. It didn't scare the daylights out. Me. I just figured I'd, I'd see what happens. The second day I did it, as scared as can be, because I knew what was going to happen. <laughs> you know, so I experienced it. <laughs> I'm going, why am I back out here? This is totally stupid. Then the third time, it was like, I get it. I'm here with a bunch of runners. 
every single one of these runners, you know, there's guys that run the bulls and there's guys that come to Barcelona to experience the fiesta and the running of the bulls. And I have so many friends there that are running the bulls that I have to come back and be with them. I have to be in the streets with them. It's an allegiance. It's a camaraderie. It's a brotherhood and sisterhood because there's women out there as well. So it's not just the guys that are crazy. Right. There's some really good female runners out there. I said, I, females are great athletes. I love fe- watching females, female athletics. I mean, it, they do everything with finesse. It makes sense that there would be females running with the bulls too, because, you know, they're a little more observant. Whereas you just said you went out there not really knowing what to expect. You just went out there for the first time. It was like, all right, let's see what this is about. And they're a little more methodical and thinking and planning and and really taking a step back, or at least that, that would be my assumption. If I'm going to make any assumption about the female species, it's going to be that there's a little more logic to it, that they're going to be, it's going to be a little more well thought out before they do something like this. Yeah, guys will muscle through anything. You know, you know more, more, more brawn than brains. You've heard that expression yeah, before. Yeah. Yeah, right. Do you golf at all, Freddie? I've been once and it sucked. Uh, Maybe because <laughs> I right. suck at it. <laughs> right. Well, I suck at it too. And, uh, and I, I play golf maybe once a year and I get out there just to have some drinks and cigars with the buddies. And I never, I pick up my ball. I don't slow the game down, but when I'm on the driving range and I'm hitting the ball and the ball's going left, it's going right, it's going all over the place. I don't see how a guy swings. I look over and watching a female on the driving range and the way her, the fluidity, the smooth of her motion, you know, the, the uniqueness of her swing compared to a guy who just go, ur, ur, ur. women, they are nice and smooth and with finesse and they hit the ball straight where, like I said, guys muscle. That's why women are such great athletes. They don't have, they don't necessarily have the muscle, but they have the finesse. We can talk, I want to go into how you're coaching clients and whatnot. And maybe this can be sort of the, um, sort of the uh, transition point. But when I am listening to you talking about the different levels of running with the bulls and I also get Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena vibe. So you got the ones who are along the walls watching everybody like, what the hell are these people doing? Why, yeah. you know, why are they going to do it? Or maybe you have someone standing against the wall and they're going to be like, well, I'm going to go in, but I'm going to wait for the right opportunity. There is no right opportunity, at least in life. You, you end up waiting for decades before you finish writing that first book or quitting the job where you're working the same nine to five and you haven't gotten a raise in more than five years or you are living at home or maybe you wanted to switch careers. And so there's a lot of that. And before you know it, they're in their seventies and eighties regretting that they never took that one chance. Uh, You know, I tell you, it's so, so true. And you know, even you even have people in the balconies looking down on the street, watching them run as well. And it's not for everybody. And there's some running with the bulls. And, you know, we also have a saying that if you're inside the barricades, if you're inside where the run is going to be, because you can't get out of the run, there is no exit strategy. You are going to stay in the street no matter what. And sometimes the bulls get confused and they turn around and they come back down the street, which is known as a suelto. They come back down the street and all of a sudden you have all these people with their life in danger because they have to you know, dodge this bull that's nervous, scared, and ready to attack. They're attacking animals. We, Everybody that's in the street, we consider brave. You know, as much as we make fun, we consider them brave because at any given moment, they're going to have to run. Probably because they didn't want to, but they're going to have to run. The sides of the streets are so difficult because there's so many people there that you're, they're, you know, elbows in the face and clawing at shirts and trying to get out of the way. The panic is there. That's difficult too. It's a very dangerous place to be, by the way, is on the sides of the streets because there is such, everybody's running, running for their life in some, some aspect. Yeah. It's like a metaphor for life or for, for your career. It's like, you're going to suffer either way. So are you going to suffer and take the chance and do the damn thing? Or are you going to suffer the life of mediocrity and stasis and complacency? Pick your poison. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're absolutely correct. So you can sit there and have your career and be stuck in a career and just live your life and circulate. As I say, you circulate through your life. But I believe everybody experiences that as you circulate through your life, every once in a while you percolate. And as you percolate, you may see a higher, greater you out there. But then all of a sudden you get, boom, right back into it. And you start to circulate through life again. It's like Peter, when he got out of the boat to walk on the water, he percolated for a moment. He saw himself walking on water. He was able to walk on water until life got back to him, which is, I'm not supposed to walk on water. And then boom, next thing you know, he drops down into the sea. That's the thing with people. 
when you have that opportunity to percolate, that is your first, your first call to action that there is a bigger, better you out there. Now go and start to go grab or, or grow towards that person, you know, and do the things you need to do to grow to, towards that person and become that person. When you're like, when you're lying on your deathbed, everybody says when you're lying on your deathbed and you have your family all around you and they're at the foot of your bed and you know, they, they say that when you're looking around, most men are going, gee, I wish I spent more time with my family. Some guys say, I wish I spent more time at the office. <laughs> but <laughs> what's worse than that is your ideas and dreams that are circling over your head. All those ideas and things you wanted to do with your life that you didn't do, they're going to die with you. They're going to die with you. So get it done. I mean, go for those dreams. Don't sit there and let those dreams die with you. At least grasp onto one or two or three or four. And so what if you fail? I mean, you failed the first time you tried walking, didn't you? I mean, you didn't sit there as you got up and you held on to the side of a coffee table and you wobbled around. Next thing you know, you're falling flat on your butt and you did it again. And you fell on your butt and everybody's laughing at you and telling you how cute you are as you're falling on your butt. Well, you didn't say one day, well, that's it. I'm just not a walker. I'm just going to crawl for the rest of my life. No, you kept on trying until you could walk and then run. Same thing in life. Absolutely. And, and I think we, we somewhere along the lines, maybe during our childhood, most likely during our childhood, fail to remember that because we oh, suck yeah. at everything, not just walking. We couldn't even hold our heads up when we were born. We yeah. couldn't even, we were, uh, dirty diapers. <laughs> and so can you imagine, can you imagine our family just, Oh, you know what? Peter and Peter and Freddie, they don't know how to, they don't know how to properly use the restroom. Forget that they're uh, two weeks old. Eh, discard them. So exactly. wh why, why would we want to, if our families who, the people who nurtured us when we were at our most vulnerable stages in life, if they were, it, it seems like, um, if they were able to to stick it out with us and help us and guide us, then it's uh, we owe it to ourselves and to them as well and to our communities who took care of us to to weather the storm or whatever that storm is and, and step out and do the uncomfortable thing. Well, like some guys <laughs> suck at golf the first time out and just drop the sport. <laughs> oh, <right? laughs> you remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, you know, it's interesting because you talked about what goes on in your life, but if you realize you know, your, your mind and your emotions as a child are formed by the time you're five to six years old, that's why it's so important for, for children to be completely nourished, not just with food and nutrients, but also mentally and spiritually. What I mean by that is to be built up and lifted up by their parents saying, you're doing great. You're wonderful. You're, you can make things all happen. You know, you're, you're, just make them feel big. Well, that doesn't really happen, does it? Because you, what are you told to do? Don't touch that or you're going to burn yourself. Don't do that. Bad boy, good boy. Uh, bad girl, good girl. You know, you're being told not to go running in the streets, which is proper. And you're told to look left and right, which is proper. But you also get scolded for certain things. You know, even if you step off the side, ah, they start screaming at you. And it's it's funny because your your emotions are influenced by your parents by your siblings, by your grandparents, by your church, by your teachers, by your coaches. I mean, this goes on right on down until you're 18, 19, 20 years old. You're still getting coached both negatively and positively. And then people take those emotions, whether they be negative emotions, negative self-talk about themselves into their adulthood. You're a father. Yep. Do you have time to express yourself and your emotions, your fears, your concerns to anybody, most likely not. And I'm saying this to all fathers or mothers that are listening to us right now. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have time to do that because you have to suppress your emotions to look good in front of your children. So there's a, another 21 year window from your first child and then maybe 28 win year window to when your last child leaves the house. So nearly 30 years while you're still suppressing your emotions that were given to you as a child. So here you are waking up at 40 or 45 years old going, Oh my God, you know, what about me? <laughs> yeah. 
that's a that's a and that's a tough line to that's a tough line to toe. I will tell you, I'm probably a little more willing to show a, a more authentic side of Freddie or my real name, Alfred. You know, yes. my parents are my uh, well, my parents too, but my kids see more Alfred than I would probably like for them to see. I think particularly over the past year and a half, I left radio ap- after a really good 16 year run and trying to find employment and whatnot. And so I would tell them, hey, yeah, dad's having a really hard time finding a gig. <laughs> I'm up to 50 something <laughs> rejections now. And there's a part of me that thinks it's all part of his plan, his meaning God's plan that, you know, I've got a yeah. kid that's gra- that's already at the time of this recording already graduated from high school. And then another one that's going into her senior year. And this is a very big transitional period in time of their lives. And maybe it's all part of his grand plan that they've got to see someone that they, I, I like to think that they admire me, someone that they admire get kicked in the teeth. It's a lesson for them that things are not always going to go their way. And they Mm -hmm. had a great childhood, or at least I like to think that they had a great childhood. And it's not always going to be trips to the park and playing outside and cuddling with mom and dad, that life can be really rough and you will lose and you will fail and so will the people that you love. But at the end of the day, as long as you got life, you got air to breathe, a roof over your head, food on the table, clothes on your back, and a chance to get up the next day and fight, you stay in the fight. Well, you know, you start off with your 16 years of being an on-air personality. You're an excellent on-air personality. You were well, really, really good at your job. Thank you. And uh, made the choice to throw your heart over the bar and do your own thing. It's just phenomenal. That, that takes courage. Thank that you. means you're getting out in the street. You're getting closer to the bulls. Right? You're starting to get there with life and doing <laughs> the things that maybe you were meant to do, not something that you just fell into and became really good at. Yeah. But here's something that that, that really kind of gets you out of bed every morning with a big smile on your face and fills your heart and and soul. And that's, that's what it's all about. When you get to, when you're able to get up in the morning and and feel that feeling, that's phenomenal because you're doing what you love to do. The fact that you are that type of parent, because you're a rarity, you're not, I would say that you're like the 2% club of parents (laughs) that really know how to truly think that, that really know how to express themselves to their children in such a manner that you're coaching them. I mean, you're, you're coaching, hey, you know, daddy's, you know, at, went in this direction, got 50 rejections, right? But there's always that 51st ask. <laughs> you never know what's yeah. gonna happen, yeah. right? And yeah, and yeah, there's, God does have a plan for everybody. And, you know, I, I look at God as an acronym saying, you know, G-O-D stands for your grand overall designer of your life, G-O-D. Never grand looked at that one. My mind is blown, dude. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. he's your grand over design, overall designer of your life and he has plans. I mean, it's right there. It says, I have plans for you to succeed. So yes, you know, and you know what you need to do? Just two words I hate. The one is should. Like, don't should on me, okay? Don't tell me what I should. <laughs> thank you, sh- thank you, thank you. Don't yes. should on me. I'm sorry, that, I'm sorry I just said that. And the other word is but. Ooh. The word but. Yeah. Because if you're talking to me and I go, yeah, but Freddie, but it means I wasn't listening to what you were saying to me. I was trying to think of a rebuttal, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's not a but. Say, make sure I say, Freddie, I heard and understood everything you just said. And here's what I think, right? Yeah. But there's no but. So yeah. should and but should be out of everybody's vocabulary. So don't shoot on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said should, but I'll just go ahead and, and, and not shit either. <laughs> Neither one well, of I, those. I, oh, wait a minute. We're not live. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not we're broadcasting. This is not the FCC. Is yeah. it? We, can, we can't say shit. Don't shit on me. No, no, we no. Should. Yeah. No shit and no should. And, and definitely right. no buts. <laughs> that's right <laughs> man yeah. yeah 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 so that that's very cool the way you coach your your children thank you and thank that, you that's, man that's very neat. yeah thank I you that's awesome that's a coaching lesson for everybody listening to you well and and i've got it's just gotten to the point with me it's almost like and i've i've spoken with people about this too it's like when i was a, in junior high playing nintendo one of my favorite games was metroid uh metal gear was another one in the summertime my buddies and i would be playing these games and when when metroid was brand new in our house and we got the game and i, I was terrible at it but then i would lose a level and then i get to play another another round 
down. And then the second time around, I wasn't so bad, but I still didn't make it to level two. And so after all these times of playing level one, finally get to level two, rinse, repeat. Those are, those are losses. And so I compare a lot of, you know, whether I'm no longer actively searching for employment because I'm doing my own thing now. And so I took that mentality of, okay, well, the rejections, maybe I'm one step closer to getting to level two, which will be a traditional job. And so awesome. eventually it just got to a point where taking all the L's, well, maybe he, God, is telling me, you're really good at rejection, so why don't you go off and hire yourself and be an entrepreneur because you can obviously handle getting kicked in the face a lot. And yeah. so um, I think of you know the presentations and whatnot, the, the client conversations, and, and it's all just getting to that next level, and it's just gamifying the whole thing instead of getting, my, getting in my head and being like, oh, well, you lost, you're a terrible business owner, and and just go in and veg out on the couch and drink whiskey and cuddle up with a bag of Cheetos and feel sorry for yourself because that's- right, I'm confused now. That sounds pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do love Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> Bottle of whiskey and Cheetos. Yeah. I'm, I'm a Ruffles guy, but go ahead. <laughs> ah, yeah. No, but I was just saying that, yeah, I mean, there's a, I think a lot of it and going back to your original point about about the bulls being a metaphor for life is really that I mean things are just not going to go right all the time, and I think life yeah. would honestly be really boring if it did. Oh, totally. Yeah. Going back to the bulls real fast, uh, I have plenty of friends that have been gored, and you know they've had to go to the hospital and get sewn up and all that, but the next year they're back at it. They're back in the game of life. Yeah. They had to go to the hospital. Now they don't run that the rest of that week while they're there because they are, usually have to stay in the hospital for about five days to make sure of, a, uh, of infections from the bull's horns because the bull's horns are, you know, all over the place. So they keep them in the hospital, but they're back at it the following year to run again. I had this one guy, his name is Julian, Julian Medina, uh, who's no longer with us. Unfortunately, it wasn't because of a bull, but he got gored seven times, Whew. seven times, man. And, uh, the next year he's back at it, back at it. And that that's true. You know, thing about failure and Thomas Edison said it the best. He said, when he was asked why, how he felt after not being able to, to make a light bulb after 10,000 attempts, he said, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have successfully figured out how not to make a light bulb. <laughs> yeah. Think Boom. about that. And science, science leaves a trail. Scientists, you know, if you go there or any doctors when they're doing research, they write down what they did for the day and have what they succeeded at and what they failed at, what plan worked, what plan didn't work. People should do the same thing with their life. They should write down what they did right for the day and what they did wrong for the day and think about how they're going to readdress that the following day. But it's not because they did something wrong or they failed at something. They successfully figured out how not to do something and then set your plans on how you can take that failure and turn it into a win. And that's how people can grow. You know, you figured out 50 times. Okay, okay, I'm great at rejection. God had a plan for you that, you know what? He lets you dabble in this so you can learn that and finally, and people learn at different stages, but finally you figured out, this is not for me. I got to, you know, God's pushing me off the off the ledge saying, fly, buddy. It's time for you to fly. Yeah. And what you're doing, you're very great at it. Well, thank you. And I, I want to, I want to, wrap up the conversation by building on something you're talking about writing writing the list down of you know and making the kind of making that that comparison to the thomas edison quote and it's something you have on your website which by the way everybody is peter remington Dot com and there's a whole host of videos for you to watch of Peter coaching you and and telling you how you can level up in your career and in life as a whole. But and I never thought I'd be talking about math with you, man. But there's an equation, <laughs> and oh, no. I, I love the equation. It's parentheses, so it's I A plus A A times A equals I H P. Right. <laughs> I A plus A A times a equals i a d and we can wrap up the conversation with your thoughts on how uh, people me included can use this and really just do a mind shift on on our outlook when things aren't going right let me start with the fact that um, everybody has a great opportunity to succeed we all have opportunities to grow right but some people have a better chance than others whether it be socioeconomic reasons or whatever the case may be. I also have another acronym out there in a speech that I do about how to become a swinger. And uh, 
That might get a few people's tell, attention. That's, it usually does when I talk <laughs> about that at, at conferences. Yes, I'm going to teach you guys how to become swingers. Well, all of a sudden, everybody sits up in their chair, <laughs> fix their hair. I'm do no whatever. longer bored. <laughs> 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 but anyway, think about this. And if people don't do this while you're driving, think about it in your mind while you're driving. But if you're at home listening to this, you can take out a piece of paper and a pen. What you want to do is write in parentheses, do I H plus a a times your a equals your ihp well your ih is your inherited abilities your genetics what your parents gave you you know your looks your height your weight that this that your smile everything about you your eye color that is your inherited abilities you add that together with your acquired abilities that's your street smarts that's your education that is everything you know about life in general through college or whatever and then that multiplier, you add those two together. The multiplier is your A, which is your attitude. Then that equals your individual human performance, IHP. So if you think about it, here's a blue blood growing, born in Greenwich, Connecticut or River Oaks or wherever it may be. And they have great inherited abilities. That, let's say they're born in there, and that's an eight for them. They go off and they go to, they go to private school. They wind up going to Stanford. They wind up getting a, uh, education there, and they wind up getting a master's in Harvard, whatever it may be. So there's the required abilities. So if they have an eight with inherited, and let's say an eight with their education and acquired abilities, that's a 16, mm -hmm. right? So you have that 16, and then you multiply it times their attitude. So what you have there is a 16. They may have, because they have give, been given everything in their life, basically, they may have an attitude of a five. So five times 16 is an 80, and that's their individual human performance. Then you have a guy like me. I'm a middle-class guy. My dad was a Marine for 22 years, grew up on Long Island, uh, went to regular school, did not get my first degree, my first credit in college until I was 36 years old and all that. But let's say my inherited ability, my parents, uh, I'm a six. My acquired abilities, because I didn't go to school right off the bat, I learned I was, I was actually a ski bum for four years in Aspen, Colorado, and I did get to real life university education. I learned a lot then. They say my acquired abilities, instead of being an eight, was also a six, and that equals a 12. But my attitude, my attitude, if you can't feel it through these through your speakers or whatever, my attitude is an eight, right? So that eight times 12 makes me a 96. So I have an individual human performance of a 96. And now, if, if, if you're a regular, let's say you're, you're a six and a, and a four with acquired abilities, right? That gives you a 10 and your attitude, because you've been drawn, beaten down so much by society, your attitude is a five, gives you a 50. But the variable here is, what can you change? Mm -hmm. And this is what I've done for myself. I, I took, I've taken my six and turned it into a 10 as far as acquired abilities. If you're a four with acquired abilities, go back to school, take some courses, read some books. You can always get better with your acquired abilities. You can take that four and turn that into an eight. And all of a sudden your six and eight equals a 12. And all of a sudden you get, you feel so proud about yourself. You feel very good about yourself. Your attitude shifts from a five to an eight. Next thing you know, you're at a 96, right? That's how you can grow in life. You can acquire more and you can change your attitude. You're not going to change your body. You talk to or see somebody who's in a wheelchair, who's graduating college, getting a master's degree, and has an attitude that you just cannot stop. They're successful. Mm -hmm. You have this another person in a wheelchair saying the world owes me, and they're not going to have, so they don't have the attitude. They're not going to change their required abilities whatsoever. And so that's not going to help out their situation at all. Peter, my man, it's been an honor speaking with you. Uh, the website is peterremington.com. Before we go, what a uh, final ask or final final thoughts for people listening to this episode? Do you uh, do you do a to do a, a to do list every day? I don't. I'm not. Like, I'm not consistent enough. <laughs> uh, no, well, I have. You know, I. I mean, I mean, you put down. I mean, it's like your appointment book, though. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you're, you're talking to me, or you have things you got to do. That's basically your one through ten to do list. I think everybody has something along those lines at their office. What I suggest for people to do is because what they don't have for themselves is their own personal to do list. They have a to do list for everything else. 
but I'm talking about what can you do for yourself? And what I do is I do daily insights. And my insights are, I take a passage out of the Bible or something from the Kabbalists or something metaphysical from James Allen or Wallace Waddles or Genevieve Bayran and I take a quote from one of the books and then I apply it to today's life. But what I do when I get up in the morning is I'll read out of the Bible or something metaphysical. I will meditate, I'll go to the gym. But then the, what I do is I do four things. One is I set my intention for the day. I write down what am I grateful for. I write down my great I am's, which I could call images about me and how I'm going to be. And then four is what am I going to create today? My intention for the day. So my intention for today was to have a, a great podcast with you. That's what I set my intention. Be prepared for my, be aware and present for this podcast. Mission accomplished. What am I grateful for? <laughs> Thank you. My what am I grateful for? I'm grateful for my puppies that you heard earlier on. I'm, I'm grateful for my house, my wife. I'm grateful for my health. I just went to the dermatologist. I'm grateful for that cancer free on my skin and all these other good things. I am. I write down everything I'm grateful for. And then I write down my images about me. And my images about me is how am I going to portray myself as I go out in the world? I like to portray myself as being ready, equipped, fun, receptive, forgiving, willing to engage, just be that person for people. And then what am I going to create today? Well, I wrote down for my for today that I'm going to create a new book. I'm, I'm 30 pages away from finishing it. And so uh, I'm going to create a new book today and a workbook to go with it. And it's about how to become a swinger. I'm putting together a, a, a workbook for that. <laughs> That's great. And I'll have you back so, on the podcast. So we could talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I, I kind of coach on. I think people need to have their set something for themselves before they go out in the day, because now you know who you're supposed to be for the day. Yeah. Instead of, so this way things can happen, happen through you and not to you. If you have your intentions set for the day and what you're grateful for, your great I am's and what are you going to create for the day? Now you are bringing to the day what you want to bring to the day versus having the day bring to you what you have to react to. And you can get those insights off my website. PeterRemington.com, all one word, PeterRemington.com. My man, thank you for coming by the podcast. <laughs> was so happy for you, man. I'm glad, I'm glad to be here with you and really, really enjoyed the time. Thank you so much.